about, or this evening I'd like to talk about um, translation from a pedagogical perspective. I've entitled the talk Products of What Processes, because what we do at our institute, which is part of a University of Applied Sciences, is to pursue applied research and uh, research-driven teaching in the area of process-oriented pedagogy. This has been a strategic goal that we've had at Zurich University of Applied Sciences for a number of years. Um, and what this has brought to the forefront of our attention is the fact that um, cognition doesn't take part solely in the mind. It seems to take, be taking part, taking place, sorry, outside of the mind within a situation, the situation of translation as a situated activity, translation at the workplace. So our research has moved broadly from cognitive process-oriented research, looking at the way the mind works, the individual translator works at his workplace, through to the way in which the workplace and factors and actors within the translation setting are affecting the translation product. Because this has an impact on the way we teach, we're looking at ways in which we can inter integrate the two approaches, the purely cognitive approach, the one that looks at the individual translator, with the way in which translators or translation students, shall we say, interact with one another. So that's actually what I'd like to be talk to you about today. Now, uh, this is not a fully fledged, fully formed lecture in any way, nor is it an attempt to impose a particular pedagogy or an approach to tra teaching translation on you. It's just the idea is just to throw out a few ideas, things that seems to have worked at our university for our students, that perhaps you might find interesting either as teachers or as students, and would like to perhaps pursue a little further. One of the big issues, as I said, is accessing and assessing products, in other words, target text, the traditional way in which we assess uh, translation, looking at a product, grading it, combining that then with processes. But what kind of processes are we looking at? Processes can be described, or they can be observed. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about the distinctions between the two, the way in which both sides of this process-oriented teaching have been, process-oriented research and process-oriented teaching have been uh, deployed, have been looked at over the years. And then I'd like to suggest perhaps that certain criteria that can be derived from this accessing and assessing of processes can be mapped to competence models. A competence model, for instance, like the well-known EMT, European Masters in Translation, competence model. But the big question then for me is, what then happens outside of the individual mind? When the individual mind comes in contact with other minds, when people try to translate at the workplace using tools, how can we explore those external processes? So I'd like to look today, again, at a couple of things that we've been doing to, to approach, to try to access, and perhaps even assess, so-called socio-technical processes, the technical social processes involved in translation in its real form, out there in the real world, or in authentic learning in the classroom. First of all, from a descriptive perspective, and then, Right at the end, perhaps suggesting, with, re with uh, reference to a, to a small project that we've started together with Germersheim in Germany and with Grenoble in France, on how to actually track interactive data as students are translating in uh, experiential learning scenarios. Now, if we look basically at the history, really, of, uh, of, 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 of accessing and assessing learners' internal cognitive processes. There's been a long tradition of this, really, stretching right back to the, to the birth, really, of um, process research in translation in the, in the mid-'80s. Um, and even before, in a sense, 
we've always had the traditional way of trying to find out the way students are thinking about the translations they're doing by getting them to talk about it in terms of written commentaries and annotations. These are fairly common um, and uh, were used even in the 80s at our institute to assess student translations. Were they thinking enough about what they were doing? Um, a fairly, at the time, revolutionary approach by Daniel Gilles uh, was to introduce integrated problem and dis uh, decision reporting where he said his students have to almost instantaneously, as they're writing a translation, note down what they're doing, the way they're deciding things, trying to integrate it in their translation. Learning journals are a very common way, not just in translation, but in other or other branches of pedagogy, of uh, activating metacognitive approaches to uh, among students to their own work, to their own performance. And this has been deployed quite a lot also in Australia. I'll come back to that in uh, a, little bit, a little bit later. And, as I said, um, Mark Orlando down in Monash, Integrated Translation Diaries, based on uh, using this, uh, based on the, uh, the uh, National Association standards on how to actually assess um, translators, performance assess translators' competence. Think aloud protocols on the basis of what went on in the 80s were introduced quite early uh, in the 1990s by Kusmar, 95, or Howells in 2000, on set over France, 2003, Pavlovich, in various forms. You, you, students were encouraged to think aloud as they were translating, and these were then looked at in research and, in a sense, also used as teaching tools, either as monologue think-aloud protocols or in dialogue where students were talking to each other. These were recorded, these were, these were transcribed, and students, um, these were used for both research and teaching purposes. And most recently, Pavlovich did this, a collaborative, you know, multi-directional protocols amongst, amongst groups. Um, these could, what I've described, are basically what I would call um, descriptive methods, where people are describing what they're doing. But there are observational methods, and these have been facilitated by certain developments in technologies. Um, we obviously have always had the possibility of sitting beside a translator and looking what he or she is doing. Direct observation. And we can combine direct observation with dialogues. Students can talk to each other as they're translating and raise their own awareness, think about what they're doing, ask each other questions about why they're doing this and why they're doing that. That's fairly common practice, has been for some time. Um, students can intervene, uh, sorry, teachers can intervene with students and ask what they're doing. These observational techniques are fairly widespread. Um, increasingly, though, with the development of technologies, key logging software was first used about the mid uh, mid noughties um, often in conjunction with dialogues or with retrospection, where people were played back the visualizations of key logs and were able to look at what they were doing and talk about what they were doing. Again, this was deployed not only in research, but also as a teaching tool and uh, with, fair, with considerable success. Most recently, screed recordings have been used. Now, um, just, just to quote a colleague of mine, our Eric Angeloli, who works at our institute, uh, these, these have the ability of, of, of presenting in a highly visual, naturalistic manner um, each step of a process from the beginning to the end in a very granular fashion, and it seems to stimulate a lot more recall amongst students when they're looking at what's going on after these processes have been played back. Now, these have been this technique of using screen recordings has been applied in research-driven teaching, um, pedagogical experiments, among others by um, Anthony Pinn himself back in 2009, who wrote uh, a very good article with the um, it's a controversial title, "Lousy Experiments," but a very fine article on the way in which these techniques can be deployed in teaching and the results that can be achieved. We also have been doing systematically using screen recordings in our teaching at BA, MA, and CPD, Continuous for Professional Development levels and courses. Now, the advantages of screen recordings is that they, uh, they give you certain insights. They're able to show you certain things, both for research and, and to help you to look at the way students are working. 
So you can look at the timing and frequency of phases, of pauses, of the way in which uh, students write or consult, <coughs> of the way in which they switch between windows as they're working on screen. Quite an important thing for a teacher to know and see. I'll show you later how this works. Um, we can look at what we've seen in our ergonomic research um, as uh, what we've, just, we've, we've, we've just decided to call distractors and stressors elements in the translation process where the student is interacting with the screen or the translator is interacting with the screen and stressing him or herself. Too many windows open, distracted by email alerts, distracted by alerts. You know, these are potential sources of error and lack of, con uh, um, lack of concentration. We can look at cursor movements, which will then tell us perhaps what the person is looking at. But to find out more about what the translator or the student is looking at, we have increasingly been deploying eye tracking software. Now, this can't be deployed everywhere in the classroom, but you can take students down to an eye tracking lab and you can get them to look, to, to do their translation in the eye tracking lab and to look at um, afterwards at what they've been doing and looking at where their eyes are actually, actually resting as they translate. And that gives us and them insight into perhaps what went wrong in their translations. We can look at so-called fixations, which are those dots that you have um, when you look at, uh, look at, uh, look at uh, uh, eye tracking visualizations, you'll see a big dot which shows an area of attention. You can look at saccades, the way in which eye, eye or pupils move across a screen, the kind of lines, and you can actually also look at pupil dilation the way in which pupils dilate, which can indicate amongst students, amongst translators, um, it's taken as, 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 as indicators of cognitive load, stress. As I said, we can look at areas of interest, we can look at attention shifts, and we can look at the cognitive load with this. Key logging, if we add this, and these are cumulative, you can do a screen recording with eye tracking overlays and actually do pre-logging at the same time, gives you very precise time data on the way in which the students are keying, clicking on things. That becomes important when you want to analyze, for instance, uh, recursive revision, the way they move backwards and forwards as they're writing their text, how many errors they make, how many typing errors they make. Typing errors are seen as an indicator of cognitive load or even overload, for instance. And once this has all been done, you can play it all back to students. They can look at what they're doing. You can get them to comment on what they're doing with prompts, perhaps, saying, just tell us what you were thinking of. And this is one way we can access the processes, the mental processes of students as they're working, or of professionals if we're doing that type of research. Obviously, this is self-report. This is descriptive again but it does provide us with useful indicators. Let's give you an example of, what we, of, of one deployment of this type of technology in ABT, audiovisual translation classes. Now, the students were asked to translate using audiovisual software, in this case, FAB Subtitler, European Standard, I don't know what's used here. And uh, what you see here is a so-called heat map of eye-tracked translation processes. Now, one thing you'll notice here is that, if I use the pointer, this is the heat map of the processes of an entire class aggregated and shown together, put all the process put together where they were looking. What I find amazing is that there is virtually they're not looking at the screen, they're not looking at the pictures of what they're, of, 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 of the film they're subtitling, they're not even taking any notice of that. They're looking at the spotting lists, and they're looking at the text as it's being put in. Now, this was a very salutary lesson for us, because on the basis of this, on the basis of actually seeing this amongst, again and again, amongst our students, we said, wait a minute. Now I, we understand why they're making so many mistakes, why they are not able to actually <laughs> subtitle in a way that's coherent with the pictures. 
There was one episode, there was one part of this, this was a film about prisons in, a, uh, in Switzerland, and uh, an inmate was being interviewed, and he was talking about, about the way certain things piled up. And he literally used this gesture, and every student mistranslated this word. They used piled, they completely misunderstood what piling up meant, they translated it completely badly. You can see why. If you look at the process behind the product, Now, of course, products, um, by the way, this is what, what I'm talking about here is assessing and teaching processes always in conjunction with products. I'm not saying that we work solely on the process. The product is important, but the way to work out what's behind the product necessitates us perhaps looking at the way in which that product came about. Now, here, we have a very good example taken from the, uh, the, the, your colleagues, Monash, um, of a way in which we can use described processes to assess products and processes together. And it's about the assessment here. This is on a grading assessment scale developed um, at Monash, I think together with the, uh, with the National Association of Translators in which we have very classic categories for assessing translation products. Source text comprehension, translation accuracy, omission insertions, terminology, the effect of the translation, the appropriateness of the translation. Interesting, I think, here is that 70% or 70 of the 100 points goes towards these product-oriented criteria, product-oriented assessments. But we also know that they are forced to use an integrated translator's diary where their process is assessed. But again, this is a described process. This is where the students are talking about the way they think they made decisions, often in a fairly reflected written form. But that's certainly one way of doing it. What we've decided to introduce, and this is again, you know, this is just an idea, is um, a process-oriented component based on screen recordings in our aptitude tests for our MA program. We run an MA program in translation, uh, professional translation, we call it, Fachübersetzen in German. And uh, basically, what we do is we give students an assignment, we um, give them full internet access, and we record all their processes. We use, used to use Camtasia because of, uh, because of uh, compatibility issues. We've moved to DB Flashback, as you used many, many years ago. Um, and we use, uh, we, we first of all have a diagnostic product assessment, and then we look at the processes. And on the basis of the processes, the, the recorded processes that lay behind the product, we can revise the assessment of the product assessor. So if somebody says this is a fail, we can look at the process and say, no, we'll let this person through because there's potential there. What do we judge the potential on? It's a bit tricky. Come to that later. What we do though is we offer the candidates for our MA counselling sessions so that they themselves can look at where they went wrong perhaps and improve their performance. Uh, we woo from the product discuss it to the way in which they've done the process and this is just to show you that it's it's doable although it is time intensive um, it takes about 30 minutes per coach and candidate there are always two coaches present um, that's for institutional reasons we're not allowed to be alone in the room with the student so we need two coaches that's the way it is sorry <laughs> in switzerland and each session takes about 45 minutes now give you an idea of what we see and what we, what we do. Here's a typical brief. Now, unfortunately, because we work in a lot with German, um, those of you who don't know German will not necessarily understand this, but we give the classic brief. In this case, it's a, it's a translation from a, from a newspaper. We can't be too specialized in our, um, in our texts here at, at, at the candidate level, simply because candidates don't just come off BA programs in translations. They come from everywhere, so we have a general it's just a general diagnostic on how people ha handle problems. It's not 
the way in which the problems appear solved on paper. It's the way they're actually solving the problems that interests us. In this case, we've just got a, got a case where um, a, a, a translator, a, a text from a from a German, uh, Swiss German newspaper, Neue Zürcher Zeitung, is translated into English. Okay, so far so good. Now, just give you a couple of uh, examples. Now, first of all, we have the product assessment. And this is where you see the caveats involved in pure product assessment. Because ultimately, what happens here, now uh, this is translation, not just, but primarily into the second language, because most of our students work in German as a first language, so they're working from German, L1, into L2, English, but not just. But we find this. We find that four candidates, I'm just giving you an example of four candidates and, and the comments that, that our teachers who assess the translation, or the trans, uh, translation assessors, came up with. First of all, good formulations, grammatically correct English. Good formulations, grammatical, lexical, stylistic errors. Good formulations, grammatical errors, stiff style. The English, lexical choices, grammar, formulations, English was accurate and convincing formulation. All about the language itself. It was all about the language. Only once did we have anything like a, an attempt to look at the way the students were perhaps solving the problems from a process point of view. When one of the assessors talked about time constraints, could have been an issue, but they could have been an issue. We don't know. But we can see a lot more if we look at the process. Here is a source text sentence. And the important thing, if you don't know German, is in Achtungsstellung gehen, meaning to stand to attention. This is used as a metaphor, to stand to attention. It's used as a metaphor to indicate the respect with which certain things, the ho certain holy cows in Swiss politics are treated. The translations by two candidates were as follows. There exist notions that now ignore the, 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 the problems with the, with the actual English itself. There exist notions, typical Germanic structure, in the political discourse of Switzerland that cause people to take a position of defense on the solution. Another one. When it comes to political discussion, some of the subjects provoke instant attention. Why are they making this mistake? Well, if we look briefly at a couple of these processes, perhaps we can see why. This is uh, the first first person who came up with the first solution. Looking up in Lingui, Achtungsstellung. Now here, it's speculative, but I, I'll just pause there just for a second. When we're looking at the tool, it's very hard to see. But if we look up, we see she's keyed in ling into lingui, Achtungstellung, which is a bit odd, because we assume she knows what the word means. And she sees various words. She sees Achtung and Stellung, two separate words. So the word has already been segmented for her. So, Stellung becomes position, Achtung, attention. Fairly meaningless. German tends to use a lot of compounds to create meaning, but of course the meaning of Achtung, Stellung, to stand to attention, or to be stood to attention, is slightly different from a position of attention. Okay? Interesting here as well, and this was confirmed in the session afterwards, she saw this, and the word is deference. And she said afterwards, ah, that's deference. I thought, I thought they said defense. So it's a lookup issue. It's a cognitive overload and lookup issue, obviously. Because if we go, this is the uh, this is accelerated four times. But this is the there exist notions in the political discourse in Switzerland that cause people to take a position. Now, she doesn't look back. 
but she looks at defence. She uses defence, having remembered deference badly, she uses defence. She then checks Verteidigung, which is the German word for defence, and that for her is it. That's the solution. But that's the way, especially novices, tend to work. And we can very easily help them by pointing this out to them. Now, the second candidate is, to, is all over the place with her solution. She's, this is the revision phase. She's left a gap, and she's beginning to write part of a sentence, but this is not part of the initial sentence. This is the next sentence. And she's trying to complete the following sentence as part of the previous sentence. I mean, this is basically cognitive overload pure. She is not going to get out of this issue. She cannot find a solution. She's jumping left, right, left and right. And eventually she comes up with a solution. She's looking at SMEs. She's moving now back to the original sentence here at the top of the paragraph. And again, decides, I don't know what to do here. So she goes to that good old standby Google Translate. Good, excellent, doesn't matter. We, they can use any tool, I don't mind. But you've got to use the tool properly. And she writes, unfortunately, sofort in Achtungstellung gehen, meaning the whole phrase, immediately, going immediately, standing immediately to attention, which of course limits the possibilities of what this, uh, of the accuracy of what Google Translate can give her. back. Pauses, writes, pauses. But I mean, I think you get the idea of, of, of overstretch your patient, overtax your patient. So it's on the basis of this that we decided to, uh, to collate what we were seeing, our information. We're finding that there were over and over problems again and again in macro level process phasing. You know, the students weren't, or the candidates weren't actually using a proper orientation phase, weren't looking, using, using their instruments properly at the beginning or their terminology databases at the beginning of the translation. They weren't even reading through the translation first or the text, source text first before translating. Not that you can do that all the time, but uh, in this case, with a 250-word text, you can. Their micro-level processing was very non-linear. We'll come to that later, about the significance of that. They were doing a lot of multitasking, and this, of course, leads to a lot of overload. We saw an incredible amount of uh, insecurity, pausing consultations, as pension shifts, revisions, recursivity, which professionals don't do interestingly enough, from the research we've done. And they have problem awareness issues. They seem not to know exactly what the problem type was. They were using bilingual dictionaries to solve problems that were obviously related to cultural knowledge, so on and so forth. Their problem solving patterns were also, that which resources they used were problematic. And they were exposing themselves to overload through distractors, stressors, so on and so forth. This was all confirmed in our subsequent sessions. Now, the candidates themselves were quite taken with these assessments, these feedback sessions, very positive uh, response to these sessions with very marginal disagreements about discussing these, uh, these recordings and the possibility of deploying these recordings actually in the classroom. Um, the candidates themselves were telling us quite often that they helped them, they helped it. Uh, sorry, in the, in the, in the uh, after each session, sorry, I should have made that clear. After each session, we, uh, we asked the students to do a quick um, feedback survey on the sessions themselves. And they, they were saying things like, 
procedural and strategic learning was, was, uh, was, was being fostered, helped them to analyze themselves, it gave them more security, they could learn, they, it had a potential perhaps for deployment as a peer, peer learning tool in class, it was, could be useful in assessment, it was, could be a useful tool in anonymous learning, and uh, they also said, why not deploy it, but only once or twice a semester? Too much of this can be problematic. They also said, be careful. I'm not going to, I would not like you to do this in class if I'm exposed. Retain my anonymity and uh, watch out for the time and infrastructure constraints that would be related to this. So we thought, okay, let's go off and let's have a look at this. Let's try and deploy these techniques in our teaching. And so we did a little um, experiment to see when we deployed these techniques, if there was a learning potential there. Um, we did a case study, just of a group of eight students, and looked, and again, I want to emphasize that these results would only really apply to a small group of students at our institutes. At our institute. We're not saying that these are generalizable results, but we got students to uh, the start of the uh, semester to translate a text, to do a commentary on that text afterwards, and then three weeks later we uh, got them to comment on what their peers were doing, what other translators, what their, their fellow students have been doing, looking at the process that they've done. Um, again, we then interviewed them to find out what they thought about these processes um, when, they were, when they were comparing these processes to their own. And at the end of each semester, we uh, had translate them do a translation into German, their L1 of an English source text, again, doing, getting them to, rec to, to respond to what they were doing, to look at their recordings, and to talk about them. We also got the teachers themselves, because we were interested in seeing how teachers could use this technique. We got a, two class teachers and two other teachers to, uh, to actually talk about what they'd seen as well. <coughs> Um, we uh, got them to do a commentary on what they were seeing on the MA students' processes and then interviewed them on it. Now, when we interviewed the students and after the peer commentaries, one thing that we saw was they were highly motivated when they were using these, or when these techniques were deployed. Um, they also said that this helped them to increase their awareness of uh, how inefficient, they used the word inefficient, their own practices were, and how their own weaknesses could be pinpointed and, uh, and perhaps eliminated. The teachers themselves um, quite often um, referred to the fact that they couldn't see any strategic, process, strategic processes or approaches amongst the students. Now, there are two ways of looking at this. Either there were none, all of the teachers need to be schooled in using these techniques to understand how strategies work at this level. But again, the teachers found it quite useful in finding out more about the translation unit size that the students were, 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 were translating, their revision processes, the way in which they made more explicit certain features of the source text, and above all, information behavior. This comes up again and again, research and information behavior. We also did an experiment looking uh, at students' processes and professional processes, and then looking at our weaker students and our stronger students and their processes. And what we did was, on the basis of this, we were able to derive certain correlations, significant correlations, and they were significant, um, according to statistical measures anyway, between, as I said, what the better students and the professionals were doing and what the weaker students were doing. And what we really, what we found out was and this, that resource use was a key issue, both amongst the professionals and the better students, and the MA candidates who were better. They used their resources better. Their internal resources, they were thinking, they were pausing more. They had more targeted problem identification and they were more selective in the use of their external resources. 
we also saw by looking at pausing behavior, much more stable linear processing amongst the professionals and the better students. Longer writing bursts, larger segmentation, this, this actually more or less confirms what we know about um, research conducted in the 90s amongst professionals and students, and better students, and worse students, we again had the, uh, we, Kusmal, I think, was confirming that basically the better, the more competent translators were segmenting, using larger segments, being a, able to mental model texts, store things in their head, and then to translate. The revision processes are also relatively low compared with those of, um, of uh, novice translators, and revision is smoother as a result. And finally, multitasking is reduced. This seems to be a key factor. The good students, the good translators, will be concentrating on one thing at a time. They will reduce their multitasking, and they're much more effective as a result in their tool and workplace management. So what do we learn? Screen recording payback and other process techniques seem to raise procedural and strategic awareness and improve identification of group or individual student needs when we deploy this as a tool in the translation class. And short sequences can deliver, and this we were, when we, were, when we um, did our study of um, performance predictors, we deliberately looked at 10 minutes of process. And we found that 10 minutes anyway in a process can deliver these performance measures. Why did we do that? Because we didn't want to scare our teachers off. We didn't want our teachers to think, oh, I've got to look at two hour <coughs> sequences. A 10 minute sequence per student seems to be enough to be able to let them identify where possible weaknesses among students could be. Resource use, problem identification, writing bursts, set, minimal revision, and reduced multiple tasking. We now map these elements to the EMT wheel of competence, as it's known. We can easily align these with competence items, notions of competence. So resource use can be related to language, the language competence, or the technological competence, so on and so forth. This is, I think, uh, less relevant to you, perhaps. And perhaps less relevant to us at the moment, because this wheel of competence, this is the competence model on which, um, on which many of the EMT programs, the European Masters in Translation programs, which is a standard in Europe for MA programs, is based, but it's being revised. And the way in which it's being revised is quite interesting. Because this little bit, the translation surface provision uh, in the middle, has been given a lot more weight, particularly from the point of view of interpersonal skills. If I give you a kind of overview of the new revised version, um, or the things that have changed, we see that in the revised EMT competence framework, sorry, we have, yeah, there we are, we have an emphasis on teamwork. Teamwork in the use of technologies, teamwork in collaborative, multicultural, multilingual environments. We see social media and its responsible use coming in. It's not there before. We see adapting the ergonomics of the working environment, physical ergonomics, but perhaps also the cognitive ergonomics. The ability to do that is a competence that translation students will need, according to the EMT guidelines. Ability to self-evaluate, update and develop competence and skills through personal strategies and collaborative learning. So this collaborative idea is becoming more and more important. The, the idea of translation as a socio-technical activity. Negotiating with the client. Managing translation projects. Quality control management and assurance procedures. Everything, all of these elements go well beyond the cognitive act of translation itself. So as a result, we 
have to ask ourselves, what processes should we be looking at? Should we just be looking at cognitive processes of the individual interacting with this machine, or do we have to cast the net wider? And if we do, how can we do so? Well, one way in which we can do so, and this has been done by many institutes in many situations before, is to actually do case studies. Have a look at student performance as they're working in projects, in collaborative projects themselves. This is something we did. A few years back, a couple of years back, we investigated students working on an authentic project. And as they were working on that project, we got them to tell us a little bit about the feedback they were receiving, the sources, so on and so forth. The project was conducted with tools, with translation memory tools. It was only based on 16 MA students. And we collected data on the way they assessed themselves, the way they assessed their peers. We used the descriptors from the EMT competence profile that existed then. We got them to write learning journals and to tell us about the feedback they were receiving, the form of the feedback, and what kind of feedback they thought what they were getting, whether it was good, moderate, and we coded the responses they were giving us in those journals according to the focus of the feedback, the mode, the source, and the usefulness, according to certain, as I said, verbal indicators there. We also had observation notes from the teachers, the client's assessment of the situation, and we had a discussion with the students. And the upshot of this all was that the client was impressed, thought it was an expert performance. They thought the translation was functionally adequate, the interpersonal consultation was good. Interpersonal. That aspect is being covered when we ask the client, perhaps more. Target text quality, according to the teacher, was high. But the teacher also pointed out her own role co conflict. She said this was difficult because I had to step back and I was in conflict and I wanted to intervene with the students, but the students were left alone and they had to be left alone. She interviewed perhaps too much. And she pointed out that her own learning was accelerated during the process. She wasn't just statically the advisor, she was learning a lot, pedagogically and technologically. The questionnaires and the plenary discussion showed that they were positive to this, that the, that the research, the involvement in the research itself was a motivational factor of this for the students. They felt they were being taken seriously. The self-assessment that they encouraged their reflection, the instruments were unobtrusive, the teaching was okay, they thought, minimally invasive teaching they liked, actually. In other words, we don't need to be scared of relinquishing control. And interestingly, we had information on the way the client helped them with their feedback. Yes, the client was helpful if he or she was task relevant, timely, and unmediated in the feedback given. I'll skip that because that's less relevant. But when we looked at the results, the coded results from the learning journals, we found, first of all, that and this is quite important for learning, I think. I'll go back there. When we asked the students, when we looked at the students' learning journeys and where they were learning most, basically, feedback sources in the learning journals, the ones that were green are those that mark, were marked very useful and useful. And look at this. It was the peers, it was their other students that they were learning from. The teacher, comments, when we, when we count them together and it's a percentage of overall comments, the teacher, presumably because of the minimally invasive nature of her teaching, was not given a very high, high rating in terms of the usefulness of the feedback. And the client, well, perhaps room for improvement there. But peer learning, this tells us that peer learning really does work. And these type of research initiatives really help us look at the way in which Learning can be promoted in 
process-oriented teaching from an external point of view, not from the internal cognitive relationship between translator and his or her text, but from the point of view of everybody working together. So the upshot was that the teaching was appreciated, role conflicts were, were obviously there, but some, that's something that could be approached if we know about it. And above all, the feedback, this was the focus, was reported as more useful, or most useful, when it was peer-sourced, when it was bilateral, as opposed to group moderated. That's also interesting. We always think that you know getting students together in a group and getting them to talk helps them. No, 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 bilateral feedback. That's the one they like. Dialogical and interactive rather than monodirectional. In other words, can I ask questions? When it was direct rather than mediated by a project manager, they didn't like the project manager mediation. When it was timely, of course, and when it was task relevant. So where are we now? Well, that was again an example of the way in which students are a reporting on their own processes. They're describing their processes, they're describing the external processes within an interactive group. But it's descriptive. We're relying on the students to tell us the way they felt. So it's filtered in a way. Wouldn't it be good if in the same way that we can observe screen recordings, if we could get some kind of insight into how they actually do work, how the processes in socio-technical environments work. How can we track those? Well, there are ways, and that tracking is being done at Gaumersheim, above all. First of all, though, where do we want to go? But the first thing that we've noticed is that Participant inclusion in these type of authentic experiential scenarios helps us to explain, to, to understand more about the processes involved and how we can teach better. So the next aim is to do more of this type of action research, but with the involvement of all actors. In the actual analysis of the data, because only then can we perhaps gain more insights into the position of the client, him or herself. And let's face it, clients get a free translation. So this could be the payback. Okay, you help us analyze the data. Get the teachers involved in the analysis. Don't just let researchers analyze the data. And above all, get the students involved in analyzing their own responses. But when we come to the tracking of processes, why not look at interactive online data? This can be done. The tools are available. And we've just launched a project, together with Glenorgan and Mites, to combine our self and peer assessment approach at Zetaave, which we, we used in the, in the experiment I just, or in the study I just described, together with something that they're doing at Gerasheim, they're using a tool called Slack, which enables you to record every collaborative interaction that students make on that tool and download it as a transcript. What a great source of information. You can actually track the way students are talking to each other all the time. They've got a project called the Translation Agency Simulator doing that. So we want to combine the two. And what we want to do is we want to look at the way in which they view themselves, the students and the teachers. We want to look for indicators of what we call the self-concept, first of all. And then on the basis of that, develop formative and summative assessment criteria related to these interpersonal components, these soft skill components as well, that are becoming increasingly important in the EMT framework. 